Talking with the experts. In episode 566, Unlock Income Independence with Steve Selengut's insights on portfolio stability and growth strategies. I was always interested in um, business. My father had his own business. He was a real estate developer and stuff like that. Um, had rental rental properties. He sold insurance to the people who bought houses from him. He took back mortgages. And he always talked about how how necessary it was to, you know, for your comfort level, your existence, to have several streams of income. Um, sometimes it's tough to sell property. You've got rents coming in. You got insurance premiums coming in. You got mortgage interest being paid. You know, so he always had this, and he always sort of embedded it in uh, my brother and my minds that whatever we do, whatever you invest in, make sure it pays you some some kind. Talking with the experts. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. This is where we discuss great ideas to take your business to the next level. How do we know these ideas work? Well, it's because we're talking with business owners who are using these ideas. Business owners who have years of experience and expertise. All things business by business owners for business owners. And now, here is your host, Rose Davidson. Hello, welcome to Talking with the Experts. I'm your host, Rose Davidson from rosedavidson.com. Talking with the Experts is all about business, by business owners, for business owners. You can find it on all podcasting, streaming platforms and on YouTube. Today, my guest is Stephen, oh, sorry, Steve Selengut, and he is going to be discussing with us achieving income independence. And some of the things that we'll be covering is the six basic principles of income-focused retirement investing, what's wrong with the 4% annual withdrawal rule, and I'm sure that's probably based in the US, uh, what is market cycle investment management, and uh, what's the difference between growth management and growth working capital. Now, Steve is a 40-plus year professional investment manager whose current uh, adventure is coaching both individuals and other advisors in creating income independence for themselves and their clients. He's also got a, a book out. It's called Retirement Money Secrets. Uh, he was a private investment manager for 44 years and personally managed um, around 300 individual portfolios in the US and abroad. One of... Um, the very few investment book authors who has directly managed other people's money. Steve, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Talking With The Experts. Thank you for joining me and sharing your knowledge about investments. Well, thank you, Rose. It's a pleasure to be with you. Tell me, uh, yeah. you've been in the game for a very long time. What brought you to um, this line of work? Oh, well, a uh, long time ago. <laughs> I guess uh, I was always interested in um, business. My father had his own business. He was a real estate developer and stuff like that. Um, had rental rental properties. He sold insurance to the people who bought houses from him. He took back mortgages. And he always talked about how, how necessary it was to, you know, for your comfort level, your existence, to have several streams of income. Um, Sometimes it's tough to sell property. You've got rents coming in. You've got insurance premiums coming in. You've got mortgage interest being paid. You know, So he always had this, and he always sort of embedded it in uh, my brother and my minds that whatever we do, whatever you invest in, make sure it pays you some, some kind of income. So I was very fortunate. I actually, I think it was, I made the decision not to go to an Ivy League school and to go to a small college out in Pennsylvania. And uh, I guess the difference of the amount he had to spend on me for education, plus he used to take a, take money from what I used to make, make as a kid when I was mowing lawns or doing other jobs um, and invest it, have it invested for me. So when I was 25, I got this uh, literally a uh, pile of stock certificates. Now, people don't even see stock certificates anymore because they don't send you 
evidence that you own shares in a company. It's all electronic. But in those days, you actually had a piece of paper that said you own 100 shares of Esso or Shell or whatever. And uh, so I started I started my right then when I was age age 25, I started studying the ups and downs of these excellent companies, all of which paid dividends. And <clears throat> I got used to the idea of this money coming in, I could reinvest it. And then with the broker I I uh, was dealing with, we came up with this idea that why are we just watching this thing go up and down? Why don't we take advantage of that, what they now call volatility? And they usually, volatility is not a four-letter word. It's, a, it's, it's an opportunity word. It means you can buy and sell the same excellent company over and over and over again for a profit throughout the period of time you you are involved with it. I discovered that, not that I, I didn't discover that in the sense that I invented it, I discovered it for myself. And I started trading these great, what you'd call blue chip companies. And I did that to the point where I no longer had to commute to New York and go to work for this dead end job I was in with a company in New York, spending a lot of money commuting and, and a tremendous amount of time. The only benefit I got from commuting to New York was it gave me time to study for my master's degree on the bus. That was that was the only benefit. So uh, so I left and I started. I talked to a couple of friends of mine. I showed them what I had done with my portfolio, how I had grown my income so that it was about five times what I was making at my job, which was that's a pretty significant achievement. Um, and they said, "Okay, count me in." I'll, I'll let you. So then I had to figure out how to get a license and all the other stuff. But eventually, that's how I started with uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't even remember how much they gave me to invest, maybe twenty or $30,000 each. And by the time I got done in uh, May of 23, I was managing $110 million in capital. <clears throat> Quite a lot of money, yeah. yeah. So it's I sold, not, I sold it. Just that, that's for sure. But the th but the key of it was that that but that money was producing enough that I could take the delayed payout and not change my lifestyle. You know, I was still making as much from my investing as I was when I was managing the hundred and ten million. You know, so it's that's where and then and I started coaching, and that's where I get people. I can look at their portfolio and I can tell them, you know. I see what you've got in assets. I see what you have, what, what your income is. Yeah, we can duplicate that. We just have to make these changes and do this and do that. And you have to start taking profits and we'll, we'll get you to the point where you can thumb your nose or start another business or start your own business. You know, do what you want to do. Travel the world. Go to Australia. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, you know, they, you, you've said, um, in in your in your uh, bio here that there are six basic principles of income focused retirement investing. Would you like to touch on those a little bit, please, Steve? Sure, sure. There are four of them. Four of them, actually, all of them apply to all forms of investing, not just income investing, but income focused investing is is in in itself a little bit different than what most people do. And I guess the first thing of all is to get that mindset changed, the focus uh, from looking at the bottom line market value, which you can't spend, you know, mm -hmm. even if it goes up 50%, that doesn't mean you can spend more money. It just means that your house or your car or your investment portfolio is worth 50% more than it used to be. <clears throat> but until you sell it, you don't have to have, you don't actually have anything in your hands that you can spend or reinvest. So to get that, wrap your head around the idea that even though your broker tells you, wow, your portfolio is at an all time high right now. Yeah, but it's only paying me 2% income. I can't live on that. You know, that's the key. So that focus is one of the big things. Uh, I guess the other generalization that applies to everything is that the markets, all the markets, the world markets are 
volatile. They, they're changing. They're cyclical. They go up and they go down. They always have. They probably always will. Uh, no matter what disaster has struck the world over the past centuries, the stock market has always come back to establish new highs. No matter how high it's gone, it's always managed to go back down again. Not all the way, except in the uh, Great Depression, but goes back significantly. So these, this volatility, which you could uh, look at on a micro level too, every company has its own little pattern. Every sector has its own pattern. But you can take, instead of... People getting all upset about, oh, my God, the volatility is killing me. They say, ah, it's volatile. You know, it's down today. I can take advantage of lower prices. It's up today. I can take profits. You know, that's the way you got to think about this. You have to have a the positive opportunist outlook at all these things. And then there's the four really basic principles of making individual investments. The first one is quality. You've got to come up with a personal way to gauge the quality of everything you buy. Is this company profitable? Does it pay a dividend? Is it a one-show pony or does it have a diversified product line? <laughs> um, you can't really tell whether the management's any good or not because who are you to judge the management of somebody else's company? But but you can look at its range of price over the years to see if it's stable, uh, that type of thing. So you, um, the next one is, does it pay me income? I don't care if they pay their chief executive $600 million a year. What are they paying me? I'm an owner of this company. I want money. If they're profitable, I want dividends. Okay? They're not paying dividends. They're being selfish. They're being disrespectful of my ownership. I'm not interested. Okay? Yep, absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, uh, th this is where uh, a lot of big companies, you know, fall down a little bit as they're not looking after their, their shareholders. Um, and, you know, not paying those dividends that they're entitled to each year. Right. They they scrimp on their employees and on their shareholders, not realizing that every dollar you put in the hand of someone who's more likely to spend it is going to be better for the economy as a whole. Mm, you know, absolutely. A, so then <clears throat> the third the third one is to diversify. And most people who've gone to a business school or something like that have been taught you never want to have more than 5% of your assets in any one security. And uh, I, I agree with that. I don't, I, you know, I never had anybody have that much money in, in one security. Um, when I coach, that's one of the first things I look at. Is your portfolio properly diversified? If somebody comes to me, uh, sends me their information, and I don't have an appointment with them for another three weeks, I'll send them an email. I say, hey, you know, you got 60% of your portfolio in this one stock. Not a good idea. The market's at an all-time high. You should have a huge profit. Start taking it because who knows when it's going to go back down again. You're not going to be happy. You know, so those types of things. Um, and the final one is pretty much what I just said. People do not take their profits. Uh, investment advisors do not encourage people to take their profits. There are reasons for that. Um, one reason is that I don't know about Australia, but the U.S. is probably the most litigious country yeah. in the world. And if... If if your broker tells you sell Microsoft, even if you made a hundred percent profit, and it goes up another hundred percent as it has, um, you can sue them and you'll probably win. You know, so they avoid encouraging people to take profits. I used to tell my clients when you sign this agreement with me, you're there's a paragraph there that tells you I'm going to take profits. You're never going to see a profit a 60% profit because 
my limit is 10%. I am going to take it. I'm going to reinvest it and I'm going to do it again and again and again. And I told them and they had to sign off on it that I was taking profits and they knew I was going to take profits. So, and, and you don't, you never look back because there's always another opportunity. So even if, even if, yeah, you didn't, you might not have held Microsoft long enough. It doesn't pay any dividends by the way, or, or it pays a very little one. Now it never used to, um, you can you can say you can trade you can trade Exxon five times and make as much as you would have made on, on Microsoft. You know that's that's the type of thing. So those are those are the six basics that my book um, Retirement Money Secrets. Mm -hmm. You want to see All cover? Right. No, yeah, I can say that. Yeah, yeah. Retirement Money Secrets. It's, Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. We'll get into that in a moment. Now, tell me about what are the five biggest mistakes that investors make, Steve? Uh, not following those basic principles <laughs> is one of them. Um, when they do have income, one of the mistakes they make <clears throat> is they either automatically reinvest it instead of selectively reinvesting it, or they spend a high percentage of it so they don't have enough to reinvest to grow the income. The more you reinvest in new positions, the more you grow your income over time. So that's, that's two additional mistakes other than the not doing quality, not being diversified, not taking profits and so on. So those are, those are two additional ones. I guess another one is falling in love with, a particular company you know it's a, or even holding one because it gives you a memory of of your your parents it, it was my dad's stocks you know that type you see a lot of that um there everybody has different quirks um some of them you know whatever they hear something on tv and they say well i gotta buy a bunch of AI stocks now because they're the new thing. They're the new thing, which they may or may not be. But there's a way to do all that. And I use closed-end funds, which are similar to mutual funds and ETFs in the sense that they hold a lot of companies. So I can buy a closed-end fund that specializes in AI, in energy, in healthcare, in cereals i don't know anything you want you can get uh but i don't have that risk of having one company that i'm rooting for and open i used to i had a client once back in the day that he didn't want me to own more than one oil company this was you know back in the 80s when all the companies were merging and you can if you own 10 of them at the end of the year, there was only five of them left. But if you owned all 10, you got those bonuses of the takeovers. And he only wanted to own one oil company because, of, you know, I want you to get the best oil company. How do you how do you figure that out? You know, so, you know, there's people have all these little quirky things. So um, about 20 years ago, I stopped um, investing in individual securities because at that time, you remember the Great Recession, and then we came out of that recession, and the stock market really didn't go down again significantly. And I, my target was always wait until they're down twenty percent, and then you buy them, and your target, your target to sell them is ten percent, so they don't have to go all the way back up for you to make take your profit. You know, so that was the principle or the theory, mm. but all of a sudden they never went down. So at that at that point, when they when they didn't go down, um, you said, "Well, if everything is up and this one's down, maybe it's foolish to buy that one instead, because nothing else is down." You know, so I stopped doing it, and I started and I started to, do, in addition to the income, mortgages, preferred stocks, bonds, and things like that, that I was doing in closed-end funds because the ease of trading them, you can't, they're not liquid securities. Like you can't go out and sell. If you own a mortgage, you, it's hard to sell it to somebody else. 
But if it's owned in a closed-end fund, you can trade it on the stock exchange just like a stock. You know, so I had done that. And then, but I started doing it in equities too. And and I literally own every possible equity that you could think of buying, you know, perhaps other than penny stocks and a new issue or something like that and, um, without having the risk of individual securities. And that's, that's, I think another mistake is that novices will just throw their money in at a couple companies they think are going to be great and they'll just, you know, set it and forget it and not do any of the other things we talked about. Mm. Now, getting on to your book, um, The Retirement Money Secrets, what can people expect from, um, you know, reading it? I think they'll, they'll find it an opportunity to, it, they'll, it, for many, it's been a light bulb moment. You know, oh, my God, yeah, income. That's what I spend. I can't, you know, uh, market value fuels the ego income fuels the yacht that's right on the cover of the book i say why am i why am i chasing this market value with the, these companies that are paying me no money at all and they just i just watch them go up and down with with the market cycle why don't i still own those very same companies but in the form of a a closed end fund that pays me 9% while I'm owning them and I can sell it if I want to and when it goes up and buy it again when it goes down. So that's, you know, that's what the book will talk, will get you interested in doing that. And it'll make you see that you can also gain in market value over the years, just by the reinvestment of all the income you'll be making, <clears throat> but closed end funds. And I ought to clear up why they're different from the other types of funds closed-end funds are trusts and in the trust uh, document they're required to pay out 95 percent of their net earnings to their shareholders so just think if an amazon or an exxon or any of the major companies paid out 95 percent of their profits to their shareholders how great that would be not, but the company wouldn't grow, would it? Because it wouldn't right, have right. that it money make, to reinvest. Money. Right. It right. couldn't. It couldn't drill another. It might only be able to drill one drill, one new well instead of a hundred new wells, because it's it's paying it out. But that's the principle. You so you're you're in a security whose focus, whose thrust, whose reason for being there is to pro provide you, the owner, with more income. It's not there to build your ego. It's to build your wallet, fatten up that old wallet. That's what its purpose is. And right. most people, once they start using these vehicles, realize that they're still participating in all of the markets, but they're making a whole lot more money while they're doing it. Mm, I see. That's quite quite an interesting uh, way of looking at you know building your stocks and and you know making money out of them and not sitting on your laurels and and you know just hoping for the best. Now you can find Steve at um, on his website at theincomecoach.net. He's also on Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, he's got a group and uh, and you can purchase his book on Amazon. And I'll leave all those links in the in the show notes when they go um, up on Facebook, uh, on um, Instagram, not sorry, on YouTube and SoundCloud, <laughs> but they'll also be put on uh, Facebook, Instagram and on LinkedIn. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me on Talking With The Experts. It's uh, been a very enlightening conversation. Well, good. I, I hope your listeners gain something from it and uh, it's been my pleasure. You've been listening to Talking With The Experts, hosted by Rose Davidson. Make sure you have a look at our back catalogue over at talkingwiththeexperts.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. We look forward to your company next time.